go ahead and turn in your Bible to the book of Zechariah. How many of you are excited to get into the Word of God this morning? Okay, a few of you. All right, that's good. I can work with that. Um, you know, when, we, when we're preparing our hearts for worship, it's not just preparing to come and sing songs. It's not just preparing to come and, and do something at the church. We should also be preparing our heart to receive the Word of God, that it might be implanted in our hearts. And so when we are preparing as, as we come to this this morning, we look at this text and it's a lot. We're going to cover the whole chapter, Zechariah chapter 6 this morning, and, and there's quite a bit to get into. So if you have found it already or if you haven't, we're going to go ahead and begin reading in verse 1. If you want to follow along and, and on the screen, you're more than welcome to. But the prophet begins, he says, Then I lifted up my eyes again and saw, and behold, four chariots were coming, coming forth from between the two mountains, and the mountains were bronze mountains. With the first chariot were red horses, with the second chariot black horses, with the third chariot white horses, and with the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them mighty. And I answered and said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth. With one of the black horses are going forth to the north country, and the white horses go forth after them, and the dappled ones go forth to the south country. Now the mighty ones went out, and they sought to go to patrol the earth. And he said, go, patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried out to me and spoke to me, saying, see, those who are going to the land of the north have caused my spirit to have rest in the land of the north. And the word of, God, the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, take an offering from the exiles, from Heldai, Tobijah, and Judea. And you come the same day, and come into the house of Josiah the son of Zephaniah, where they have come from Babylon, and take silver and gold. Make an ornate crown and set it on the head of Joshua the son of Jehozadak the high priest. Then you will say to him, thus says Yahweh of hosts, behold a man whose name is Branch, and he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of Yahweh. Indeed, it is he who will build the temple of Yahweh, and he who will declare the splendor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus, he will be a priest on, the, on his throne, and counsel, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. Now, the crown will become a memorial in the temple of Yahweh to Halem, Tobijah, Judea, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off will come and build the temple of Yahweh. Then you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you, and it will happen if you utterly listen to the voice of Yahweh your God. Father, this morning as we read these words, and some of these things may look familiar, some of them might sound confusing, I pray you bring clarity. I pray that I'm, as the pastor and the preacher today, able to speak with clarity, that it not be a matter of anxiety, but a matter of hope we read today, a matter of peace as we understand this vision of rest, Father. We ask this again in the name of our Savior. Amen. We read this, and of course, like I said in my prayer, there are some familiar things in it, things that if you've read the Bible, if you've studied prophecy and things like that, things that are going to sound kind of familiar, Four horses. Where have I heard that before? But what we're really seeing is in this entire interaction with Zechariah and the angel and the voice of God, we're seeing almost that classic good news, bad news scenario. But if you're in Christ, it's all good news. In fact, what we're seeing, and I hope you understand this this morning, the one main point is that his wrath will bring our rest. I'll say that again. His wrath will bring our rest. Now there's a lot going on in this text this morning, just like there was last week in our 
message. There was a lot of movement, a lot of this and a lot of that, and a lot of if you miss, if you blink, you're going to miss it type of stuff. And we're seeing that again here in our text. There's a lot of moving parts, and we don't want to miss anything. The text begins with these horses. And these horses clearly represent God's judgment, God's wrath that he's pouring out upon the world. But at the end, there's this promise of this man called Branch, and we, you know, spoiler alert, that's Jesus. That's, that's the Messiah. And he's going to come, and he's going to build his millennial temple, and he will be the eternal temple, and he's going to do something no man could ever do. He's going to bring rest, and we're going to enjoy that rest in his perfect presence for all eternity. Again, I'll say it, his wrath will bring our rest. Now the first portion, the first pericope of this chapter, you might say, is this promised retribution. A promised retribution, a promise of God's judgment upon the earth. Zechariah again lifts up his eyes as he did in the second, the third, and the sixth vision. And now here again in the last vision, the last of the eight night visions he has, he does The same thing, he begins in a like manner. He says, Then I lifted up my eyes again and saw, and behold, four chariots were coming forth. Now, if we didn't understand the first chapter, we're probably going to be a little lost here in the sixth. The chariots and the horsemen of the first chapter are going to be connected, in a sense. We're going to be able to understand the chariot horses in light of those that were with the man among the myrtle trees. And they were patrolling quietly, if you recall, back in chapter 1. They were among those brushy trees in the valley of Kidron between, between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. And if the writers of chapter 1, if you recall, they were they were Mount Zion's Mounties, right? They were heaven's advance scout team. And if those were the army rangers going ahead, now comes the tank division. Chariots don't scout. They come to crush. They come to conquer and take the enemy down. There's only four. And you might say, well, that's a pretty small tank division. But when you understand the power of God that rides behind them, that's all we need. When God releases them to battle, the battle is as good as over. And they were coming forth from between two mountains, and the mountains were bronze mountains. Now, I don't know about you. I've been in foreign countries. I've been around this country. I've been through mountains, and I've never seen one completely made of bronze. So we understand he's speaking in metaphor here. Bronze is typically a sign of both God's judgment and his holiness. We see this very clearly when we come to the book of Revelation, specifically in Revelation 1.15, describing Christ in this vision that John has. He says, His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. But then he comes to the church of Thyatira, one of the seven churches of Revelation, and listen to how he describes Jesus there. He says, this is what the Son of God, the one who has eyes like a flame of fire, that means he has a piercing gaze. It's not like he has Superman's heat ray vision, okay? He is looking into the heart of the people. That's what that means, He has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze. They are clear, pure, holy bronze. Thyatira, if you recall, was the church that only tolerated the presence of that false prophetess Jezebel. And though his wrath was coming for her, and his wrath was coming for those who would, as the Revelation says, got in bed with her, Those who tolerated her were also going to have to suffer judgment if they did not repent. Bronze is also, of course, a representation of God's strength and the wrath of battle. The psalmist makes this clear. Psalm 
18.34 says, He trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. If you recall from 1 Samuel 17, the story of David and Goliath, much of Goliath's armor was bronze. So while the mountain's presence would no doubt be great and be intimidating, the reader is to understand these riders are coming forth from a place of judgment, a place of holiness, a place of strength, and a place of wrath. Now some people say this, these mountains suggest somehow God's heavenly temple or the, the gate of heaven even. Some suggest Solomon's temple. In 1 Kings 7, it, it, it speaks of the pillars of bronze that were in the temple. Others say they represent a spiritual protection of sorts that God has put in place around his people. But I say to you this, if we read this in light of the context of Zechariah, we can easily understand from the first vision what these two mountains are. The first vision, if you recall, takes place in the Kidron Valley between Mount Zion and the Mount of Olives. These were the two mountains. Notice he doesn't say these, take, these are coming from a place of two mountains. He says the two mountains. He's referring to the same thing. And they both have great significance in the coming of Christ. In fact, we'll see when we get to chapter 14, Zechariah 14, 4. In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. On top of that, if you recall, we saw scouts paving the way for the chariots back in chapter 1 by riding through this valley between the two mountains. Now the fact that these mountains are seen as bronze just lets us know the riders are coming forth in God's divine judgment. And so they ride. They ride forth, it says, with the first chariot were red horses. Now, if you recall, this is the same color of red, not as the horse of the man with the myrtle trees, uh, the angel of the Lord in that vision. This is the color of the horses that rode behind him. The Hebrew word is adumim. It's the color of blood. And again, they would represent wrath. They would represent judgment. And more than likely, they represent war. And with the second chariot, there are black horses. Black here in the Hebrew is seharim. And it's charcoal black. It's a deep black. Most scholars agree that these horses would represent death and famine in light of Revelation 6. And I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. There were no black horses in chapter 1, if you recall. These have been, if you'll forgive me saying, added to the stable and with the third chariots, there are white horses. The white horses, the Hebrew is Leban. It is a pure, clean white. You might say bleached white. And again, like their chapter one counterparts, these are a testament to God's purity. A purity in his work. A purity in his justice. And even purity in his wrath. They also signify a return to peace, to prosperity, and ultimately, these are the horses of victory. And with the fourth chariots, the fourth chariot, excuse me, dappled horses. Now this is a little different. They have replaced the sorrel horses of chapter one. They're often seen as spotted, mostly white with bigger black spots, uh, making them a blend of, of gray almost. The Hebrew is barodin, and it's a very hard word to translate into English as colors can sometimes be. Some suggest that dapple actually means pale, but that's not what the text tells us. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, he points out that they're speckled, spotted, and even an ash color. The dappled horses likely represent the aftermath of battle, the burning anger of the Lord. Now this morning here, we're given a very good opportunity, a valuable opportunity, because these horses provide for us a chance to interpret Scripture in what's called hermeneutics. It comes from the Greek word hermeneia, to interpret, or if it's in, in language, to translate 
Now, as I hinted a second ago, several writers, several scholars state that we should view these horses in the light of the Revelation 6, four horsemen of the apocalypse, where we also see a rider on a white horse, a rider on a red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse. But we should not be too quick to jump to that conclusion and try and force the dots to connect. We have to be careful how we draw these parallels and understand what Zechariah is writing. A good example of why not to do this, that white horse follows the black horse here in our text, but in in Revelation 6, he precedes all the others. And if we look closely, we see that white horse is carrying a false Christ. He carries a bow with no arrows. He will conquer through diplomacy. He will try to intimidate with war, but he is not a man of war himself. If he were, he would have brought a quiver with arrows to shoot. Instead, he rides out overcoming and to overcome with a crown on his head that was given to him. Now we understand this, as I said, to be the Antichrist himself. He may promise the peace and the prosperity that his horse signifies, but it's a false prosperity. It's a perverted peace, the peace that God promises with his white horse pulling this chariot. That's an everlasting peace. That's a true peace. The pale horse of Revelation 6, by the way, the Greek is chloros. It's really not understood as pale, but a sickly, almost green color. Not dappled, as some might suggest. His rider brings death, pestilence, wild beasts of the earth. Now, we should view these horses first in the immediate context, and then, if we can, and if we must, build out from there. And since chapter 1 has given us insight into the purpose and how do we understand these, we begin there. The black horses is really the problematic horse of this chapter because he's not mentioned in chapter 1. And from there, since that's not the case, then we can build out and say, well, we do see black horses in Revelation, and we understand that that, that is also a famine-carrying horse. And so we can understand the black horse is, of course, a famine. Regardless of their color, Zechariah concludes all of them were mighty. Mighty is the Hebrew word emotes. It means vigorous. It means powerful. These chariots are pulled by fierce horses of war. They make the Budweiser Clydesdales look like ponies. Look very gentle. These are horses ready to ride out and conquer We should note, too, it's the horse, not the chariot, that Zechariah emphasizes. These horses are probably stomping, chomping at the bit, ready for the smell of blood. And so verse 4, Zechariah asks the angel, what are these, my Lord? And, And we've established when he says, my Lord, it's the equivalent of saying, sir. And he's not saying, what are those? Because he's never seen a chariot. He's never seen horses before. What he's asking is, angel, tell me what these represent. What do they mean? And the angel answered, verse 5, and said to me, these are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth. Now we have to be careful because when we hear about spirits before the Lord, we We may want to associate them with the seven spirits that were represented by the seven eyes in chapter 3. Instead, these four spirits would represent the four angels who stand before God. That's basically what the angel says, saying they were going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth. So who are these four then, and exactly how do we come to that understanding? Well, the Hebrew is very distinct. Typically, when we read spirit in Hebrew, it's the word ruach, which also can mean wind or breath. But here, the Hebrew is ruhat. It's the same root word, but it indicates, and it's better understood as four winds with more of a spiritual element to them, or someone over the wind, you might say. These would be angelic beings God uses to bring about his judgment. 
And likely, if you've read Revelation, you've seen them before. They are indicating or representing the four cardinal directions. A global judgment is what they are bringing. Revelation 7.1, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. What we're meant to understand then is that these four spirit beings are no doubt, though they are not seen, they are the driving force behind these chariots. That's who's riding in the chariot. That's who's pushing them. And they're bringing a global judgment, a global wrath upon the earth. The angel continues in verse 6. He says, With one of which the black horses are going forth to the north country, and the white ones go after them, and the dappled ones go forth to the south country. <clears throat> now your first question might be, well, if you're talking about global stuff, why are they only going north and south? It's a good question. I'm really glad you asked that. We're not missing anything. We have to understand Zechariah's way of seeing Israel. East and west are not mentioned because Israel was bordered on the west by the sea and a desert to the east. So the attacks upon Israel often came from the north or from the south. It wouldn't make sense to Zechariah to mention the east and the west. But to us, much later, we can easily understand that though these riders are heading north, though these riders are going south, that's just where they're going to start. It's just where they begin. You're going to notice the black horses head north. That's the same direction, if you recall from last week, those two odd-looking bird women carried that big basket or barrel towards Babylon, towards Shinar. The black horses pull their chariot north towards Babylon, and with them will come death and famine. And to ensure that they succeed, God sends the second set of horses, the white horses of victory, following on their heels. To the south, the direction of Egypt, the dappled horses will go as God deals with them through the fires of war that are left over from the red horses. You might say, well, what are you talking about? The red horses aren't even mentioned in this part. They're not given a direction. Why? Because the very next verse, verse 7, tells us, Now the mighty ones went out, and they sought to patrol the earth. And he said, Go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. The red horses are going to cover the whole earth. I don't want to scare anybody, but that tells us war is coming before the end. A great war. Einstein once said, World War III will be fought with nuclear bombs. World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. But we see here that it is inevitable. That God has decreed this. The red horses will ride out. And even Israel will not be safe. There, blood, there will be bloodshed there as well. Revelation 14, 20 tells us the wine press was trodden outside the city. That's Jerusalem. And blood came out from the wine press up to the horse's bridle for a distance of 1,600 stadia. That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of death. Daniel 11 tells us of a time when those who have insight among the people will give understanding, and yet they will be martyred. And even then, through their death, others will be joining the cause. He says in Daniel 11:35. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the time of the end, because it is still, come, still to come at the appointed time. Church, we need not fear any war. We need not fear persecution. It does not matter who sits in the White House next year. It matters, is Christ still on the throne, and is he your king? And if he's not, then you have reason to worry then you have reason to fear. And while the rest of the world will bite their nails and shake, the Christian will have rest. The believer will have peace. War will ravage the earth in the last days, and in its week will be death, famine, and ash. But as God is behind it, we understand a final holy victory for him, for his Son is waiting as the day of the Lord rests on the horizon. 
So the angel concludes in verse 8. He's crying out to Zechariah. His last words to him in this vision is, See, those who are going to the land of the north have caused my spirit to have rest in the land of the north. In other words, the sin is going to come to an end. There will be no more grieving the Holy Spirit in the land of Babylon. This is the promised retribution of the Lord of hosts. His wrath, his judgment upon a world that consistently, constantly rejects him, that chooses sin, excuses sin, clings to sin, and their own idols of greed, blasphemy, and so many more. And yet the Christian knows the victory is coming. For those who cling to him, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. When the wrath falls on the unjust, when, the, when God's judgment falls, it is not a source of pride for the Christian. It's a reason to evangelize. It's a reason to tell them about Jesus because such were some of us. We were under the same wrath. But Paul continues, he says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And therein, church, lies our rest, lies our peace, our hope. In the name of Christ and his Holy Spirit who sanctifies, who cleanses, who redeems us by the shed blood of Christ on the cross. And in that, those of us who deserve the same wrath and yet are under the blood of Christ, we may rest and hope because his wrath will bring about our rest. And it will be a permanent rest. And that's the second point this morning. It will bring a permanent rest. We begin in verse 9 and 10. The word of Yahweh came to Zechariah one more time. This is not a vision. This is a concluding thought, you might say. He says, take an offering from the exiles, from Heldai, Tobajah, and Jediah, and you come the same day into the house of, the, of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, where they have come from Babylon. When Zechariah is told to take an offering from the exiles, he's not being told, go back to Babylon and pass the plate. He's saying, you're going to take up the offering here from those who have come from Babylon. Some certain exiles that are listed who are just visiting. They're in town. God lists three men. Heldai, whose name is later changed to Helem. Not Helen. That's a woman's name. This is Helem. Tobijah and Judea. These were men who most likely brought their riches home to Jerusalem to help the people. Help get people on their feet and help rebuild the temple. Their silver and their gold was to rebuild that which had been burned down. It's possible and, and very likely they found their wealth while they were in exile, while they were in Babylon, and yet their loyalties, their hearts are home in Jerusalem. Their names, Heldai means robust, Tobijah means God's goodness, and Judea means God knows. The message for us in understanding this is that through God's good knowledge, through his goodness, the robust kingdom will one day be reestablished, or sorry, established permanently. The name Josiah means may Yahweh give. And so it's a fitting name for the man who's the host of these three men that they would also give to Yahweh. Later, his name is referred to as Hin which means grace. And thus God will gracefully give us his robust kingdom through his goodness and through his knowledge. Notice how God says this, though. He says to take an offering from the exiles. 
He lists them and he says, you come the same day and come into the house of Josiah. In other words, just as these men were coming to town and unpacking their camels and getting settled in for the night, Zechariah shows up, hey, I need your money. I need you to drop some coins in my hat here. I'm taking up a love offering. Now today, if somebody were to come to the church who was very wealthy, and it's the first time we've seen them, maybe in a long time, and we said, I'm going to need your checkbook, they'd probably turn around and leave. Or at least go, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Not these men. Now these men came with a purpose to donate. They came, the sole purpose of them being there was to spend money, to give money. If you notice the word offering in your Bible, and even I believe on our screen is in italics, right there, take an offering. It's probably in your Bible that way, because it doesn't appear in the actual Hebrew. But the English translators are making it clear for us to understand Zechariah is not going to rob them. He's going to take that which they offer, that which they have already set aside to give. The word take in Hebrew means to receive, obtain, collect, or even fetch. The wording indicates these men had intentions to give that, those funds, to give their silver, to give their gold towards a purpose. They probably just didn't know what that exact purpose would be. And so when they show up and Zechariah has a vision for what they're to give to, it makes it easier. It's kind of like a scholarship donor or someone who gives grant money. They're just waiting on the applicants to show up and, and fill out the essay. And that's kind of what they're doing. And from the gold they give him, Zechariah is then to take the silver and gold and make an ornate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This kind of brings back to mind the, what, the words of Zechariah that he shouted out in, in chapter 4, verse 5, when they had taken the filthy rags off Joshua and they were putting clean rags on him. And of course, this was pointing us towards Christ even then. And Joshua belts out, or sorry, uh, Zechariah belts out about Joshua, put a clean turban on his head. It was his idea. So they do that, but that clean turban now gets replaced. There's something even better, something clearer. God's going a step further, and he's commanding the prophet not to pray, place clean cloth on his head. He has a specific crown in mind made for this priest, the high priest. And if you remember, the priests are Levites. The Levites are not meant to wear crowns. They're not meant to be treated like kings. Kings are from Judah, priests don't wear crowns like kings, and kings don't put on the clothes of the priests. So what's God's purpose here? Church, I would tell you this morning, this is all pointing us to the coming coronation of Christ. To the installation service of the infinity. This is foreshadowing what is to come. And if you don't get excited about this, check your pulse. A day of permanent rest, a day of joy, a day of celebration, that's what we're seeing. And we're going to see it in five simple steps, five easy ways. These three men come to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. They come in order to bring an offering. An offering Zechariah is going to collect and take and have a crown made for this priest. But their offering is for the building of the temple as well. In the same way, there will be an offering for the millennial temple. Haggai makes this abundantly clear in Haggai 2. He says, I will shake all the nations and they will come with the desirable things of all nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says Yahweh of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares Yahweh of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former says Yahweh of hosts, and in this place I will give peace. That's exciting. I could use some peace. It's referring to the construction of the millennial temple. 
And the next thing we see, though, there was only a small group who had returned in the day of Zechariah and the millennial reign of Christ. All of God's people, especially all of the Jewish people, will travel like the exiles back to the promised land. It's promised in Deuteronomy 30, verses 3 and 4. Then Yahweh your God will return you from captivity and return his compassion on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where your God has scattered you. If those of you who are banished are at the ends of the sky... From there, Yahweh your God will gather you, and from there, he will take you back. People ask, what are you, you going to do if Christ comes back and we've colonized Mars? They're coming back. Not worried about it. They're at the end of this. I don't know if that's really true. Don't. Third thing we see, the, that future generation will love and fear the Lord just as these returning exiles are going to show their love by giving to Joshua, uh, to, to the funds for Joshua to have his crown. Paul says in Romans 11, 25, 26, for I do not want you brothers to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. The church doesn't replace Israel. We're grafted in. All Israel will be saved. Paul's not saying all of the church will be saved. That's redundant. He's saying all Israel. Fourth, just as Zechariah is leading them to Joshua, the high priest, those who serve Christ will be led by priests who are restored to their rightful office and the true worship of the true king. We saw that back in chapter 3. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will keep the responsibility given by me, then you will also render justice in my house and also keep my courts and I will grant you access to walk among these who are standing here. And fifth, there will be those who reject Babylon as these exiles have who will show their heart is truly on the true God. They will leave the idolatry of the world behind and they will be part of that installation service. I mentioned the installation of the Lamb of God as our rightful ruler of this world. This is fulfilled in Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no authority, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And church, if you're not excited about that, I got nothing else for you. That should get your blood pumping. I get to be a priest of God forever? I think their pay is even better than pastor. That's something to look forward to, and all of us who are in Christ get to enjoy that. Get to be a part of that. Just as we see in verse 11, Zechariah is told to take that crown and set it on the head of Joshua in the same way God is going to put crowns on Christ's head. Revelation 19.7, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. He goes on, he says, his eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems, many crowns. Not just one flimsy piece of gold and silver, many crowns. Meaning he's going to be king of everything. This is what Zechariah is told to tell Joshua. Behold, a man whose name is Branch is coming, and he will branch out from where he is. His language echoes that of the suffering servant of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. That branch will be the one who wears the many diadems. He will branch out from where he is. His, branch, his branches out as he redeems the recon, and reconciles those who are lost, who without him, those who are enslaved to sin, those with a heart of stone whom the Holy Spirit is calling church even in this moment that they may be redeemed. Jesus himself said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve to give his life as a ransom for many he branches out through his death, his resurrection, that men might be saved. Through his ascension, the Holy Spirit's work in the church, 
that we might be used of God to call others to be saved. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so many times we get caught up on those first two words, go therefore, and we ought to, we should. I'm not taking that away, but there's something else there. Make disciples. Well, I want to make disciples of all nations. We can't even make disciples at home. Someone, I heard someone more, more smarter than me this past week, he said, a young man came to me and said, Pastor, I think I, I'm called to ministry. And the first thing he said was, who are you discipling? Because that's not just for the pastor. That's for all of us. Who are we discipling? If we want to see the church grow, we want to see God move, we ought to be about making disciples. Not converts, not church attenders, not church members, disciples. Make disciples who in turn will make disciples. The Lord goes on here in verse 12, and he will build the temple of Yahweh. The people of Zechariah's day struggled to build the temple. They were failing at it. In fact, it wouldn't be until around 30, 40 BC, a guy named Herod would come along and he would restore the temple. Full renovations, make it actually what it was in Jesus' day. But of course, in 70 AD, it was destroyed and completely removed, and it hasn't been rebuilt since. But when Christ comes into his kingdom, he's going to build it once and for all, and it will be an eternal temple, a millennial temple, excuse me, and it will be a global house of worship for a thousand years. Revelation tells us when that thousand years is over and Satan is bound and cast into the lake of fire, God himself will be our temple. He will be the final temple. So we're promised, indeed it is he who will build the temple of Yahweh and he who will bear the splendor and sit and rule on his throne. Church, that's why we call him king. That's why we say he's the king of kings. And that's why we serve him now. He won't stop at just being our king, though. He goes on, he says, Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. Jesus Christ is the only person who can fulfill this. It's Joshua's crown, but it's Christ's to wear. It's just a simple foreshadowing of the great truth of his rule as both priest and king. David wrote about it in Psalm 110, verse 4. He says, Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek's one of those funny figures from the Bible we don't talk about very often. And other religions, other cults will take and twist and make into some great mythical character. He's only in one or two verses in the Old Testament. He's the king of Salem, not the king of the earth, a king of one city, a king of Salem. And he brings out bread and wine to Abraham, and he was a priest of the Most High God. That's Genesis 14, 18. Christ, in the order of Melchizedek, is far greater than Melchizedek. He will take the two offices of priest of the Most High and the king of the universe, and he will join them together. And the crown becomes a memorial. Memorial is a fascinating word in the Hebrew. It actually is the word zekaron. And we've been saying it quite a bit, even today. It's got the same root word as Zechariah. It means Yahweh remembers. This crown would be a reminder, not just to the people, but to God himself, that he would fulfill his promise. Much like the rainbow, which this month is being used for wrong purposes. That was set in the sky to promise us God would never again judge us for the same things that we're celebrating in this nation this month. Why well, say we, I don't mean us. It was a memorial, a reminder to God that he would never punish sin that way again. And so the crown too will rest in the temple to remind the people of a truth that we celebrated even today. 
as we took communion. Church, the king is coming. In a sense, it's also a memorial to Helim, Tobaja, and Judea. He and I mentioned his name means grace, but Helim also has his name changed. It was Heldai. Helim means strength. And I think it's, purpose, it's on purpose that God does this and says the name's different in this point. God will not just bring forth his robust kingdom and his knowledge with his goodness and grace, but also in strength. Church, what God builds, no man can tear down. The promise of Zechariah in this last closing argument that God makes here after all those visions reaches its climax. He says, those who are far off will come and build the temple of Yahweh. Those who are far off in Zechariah's day, that would bring to mind the exiles. But in the last days of the earth, God promises to gather all his people together, to bring them all. Just as he brought us near to him in salvation, as Paul writes, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, so too in the end of days he will draw us to himself, those who will Help Israel return to their promised land. Isaiah says, lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar and your daughters will be carried on the nurse's hip. So it will be as we rest in him in that time. We will know God's word is true. And we'll know without without a doubt that all has been concluded. And if we listen to his voice, even now we can rest in that truth. God's wrath will bring about our permanent rest. I'm going to begin to close this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. And I want to read to you this one passage from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. There are some who believe that what Paul is saying is that we no longer have prophecy, we no longer have tongues. I would strongly disagree with that. This is an eschatological verse, the same as Zechariah's prophecy. There's coming a time When people want signs and wonders now, they will be so moot in the kingdom of Christ. There will be no sickness left to be healed. There will be no lack of knowledge because we'll be in the presence of perfect knowledge. There will be no need for prophecy. We will be in the the presence of the fulfillment of all prophecy, which is Jesus Christ, as Revelation 21 tells us. But the more important thing I want you to think about this morning is love never fails. Real love never fails. And there is no more real love than the love of God for us, for his people. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Remember that passage? So if you do not know his love, whether you're here or you're watching online, I'd invite you today to seek him in prayer and in humility. Submit your life to him today. And maybe you're here and you do know his love. And church, I would challenge you to share it, to give it. As I was preparing this message, I thought of a play I saw years ago where it was one of those heaven, hell plays. And a man was good friends with a Christian. And they go before God in judgment have one of those accidents, you know, that happen in those types of plays. And and one was brought into the presence of Christ, and the other guy saw it and says, I want that, I want that. And God says, you had every opportunity to get that. Well, my friend never told me. And his friend says, well, I just wanted to love you. I just wanted to be sensitive to you. He says, you know where I'm going? You don't love me. You must have hated me, or you would have told me the truth. Church, if you know the love of Christ, share it 
and invite others to know him as well. That they may also avoid the wrath that sin deserves and enjoy the rest that he promises us in this passage. Will you stand as we close in worship?